Welcome to our roundtable discussion. I'm Chris Barenbrook, CEO of Telix Pharmaceuticals, and I'll be the moderator of this panel today. Uh, the topic of today is Gallium 68 PSMA 11 Advances in Technology, Demand, and Supply. Uh, and this is an industry leaders roundtable discussion, but of course we have the physician perspective uh, present as well today, and, and hopefully we'll get some, some practical understanding of the impact on patient care as a consequence of that. I'm joined today by Dr. Delphine Chen, Professor of Radiology at the University of Washington and Director of Molecular Imaging, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. John Bonnet, uh, Head of Strategy Sales and Marketing at IRIE, one of the leading Gallium 68 generator suppliers. Uh, Uno Zetterberg, who is Global Sales and Product Director at GE's Cyclotron and Pet Radio Pharmacy Division. And last but certainly not least, uh, Serge Lyashenko, who runs Memorial Sloan Kettering's uh, nuclear pharmacy practice, probably one of the busiest institutional nuclear pharmacies, certainly uh, that I'm aware of. Uh, so complementary institutional and industry perspectives on how to roll out uh, these exciting new radio pharmaceuticals. So I'd like to uh, start off with uh, meeting the, the end user's need. And, and I think, you know, for an opening comment, uh, it would be great to hear Dr. Chen's viewpoint on this. What will be the impact from a clinical perspective on the approval of new gallium PSMA PET tracers in the U.S. market? And how will this really impact patient care? Well, thank you for having me on this panel. Um, and so with regard to your question, the, specifically with gallium 68 PSMA, I think one of the diagnostic challenges that we have faced throughout um, you know, the entire history of treating prostate cancer is the ability to stage accurately the extent of disease. So we have always struggled with trying to find exactly where is the recurrence when it occurs, or what is the true extent of the prostate cancer when it's initially diagnosed. Because if we have better information about that, we can improve our ability to treat that patient appropriately and provide, like tailor the therapies to better manage that true extent of disease. And so we know that patients, you know, we know that they recur with prostate cancer at some point. And you know, could you prevent that if you had better initial information about the extent of the disease? At the same time, when they do recur, how do we choose how to treat them? And so that is largely driven by how much of the disease we can find and where. And so with gallium 68 PSMA and PSMA imaging in general, we as a field are really excited about um, being able to see it more accurately the full extent of disease. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what about, what about for those patients that are being surveillanced, you know, that aren't going, you know, they don't have a high enough grade of disease, they're not going straight into a, a prostatectomy, and, and therefore you're not going to be following them up as a reoccurrence, but rather in a surveillance mode. Do you think imaging has a role to play there? Yeah, potentially. I mean, the PSA blood test is obviously an established um, marker that we can use to follow these patients. And I think the pairing of both imaging and these blood-based tests in general is a really complementary and strong uh, approach for how to surveil patients. Obviously, you know, getting imaging is a more expensive way to screen patients, and um, you know, we want to manage that radiation exposure. At the same time, when we have a good biomarker that tells us when we're concerned about the change in their disease, having an, a, a really sensitive imaging agent like um, gallium 68 PSMA or other PSMA imaging agents. I mean, having that in our toolbox is a really helpful tool for being able to stratify those patients earlier than we would be able to with conventional imaging. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So one of the key focuses of this panel uh, discussion is the gallium supply chain. And, you know, it's really interesting. I mean, it's, a, it's kind of a technical question, but it, ultimately the customer, which is I think both, you know, obviously the patient and the physician, you know, have, has a certain perception about the availability and access of the technology as well. So when you're, when you're getting ready or, or maybe in your institutional setting, when you're ordering, um, you know, a PSMA imaging uh, dose, you know, do you have concerns about isotope supply? Do you, are you aware that, um, you know, that uh, the introduction of this new technology is going to demand a new, a new isotope supply chain in the industry? Yeah, I have been uh, aware of it, even though I'm not a radiochemist, um, but I speak with a lot of radiochemists and even in discussing how can we provide this service um, in the Seattle area, you know, mm -hmm. having access to gallium 68 is important. 
And as you know, with the generators being um, in more and more demand, uh, that that can potentially create a bottleneck if we don't mm -hmm. have enough generators. And it's especially, I think, impactful in the community setting because, you know, at an academic center, you know, we have cyclotrons, like many cyclotron facilities um, can make gallium-68 and that can help fill in some of the gaps for gallium-68 shortages. But, you know, to get out into the community, you really need access to the generators. That was the, a lot of the excitement with having more generator-based um, pet isotopes and pet rated pharmaceuticals because it gives you that access to a broader population across the country. So as you can see from uh, Dr. Chen's perspective, there's a real unmet clinical need to have flexibility uh, for gallium doses to, you know, to provide a quick diagnosis and, and improve uh, patient care. We're hearing a lot of um, you know, inaccuracies in the market about how gallium is produced, how available it is, how, how the supply chain works, um, and exactly what the impact of new gallium-based tracers are going to be uh, in the market, particularly for PSMA imaging, although of course there's uh, plenty of other uh, interesting gallium tracers coming down the pathway. I think it would be interesting next to address some of these topics uh, with Jean Bonnet and Uno. You know, maybe uh, maybe starting off uh, with you, Jean. Uh, you know, how are your customers and, and end users sharing their concerns about the availability of gallium and the robustness of the gallium supply chain? Uh, thank you, uh, Chris. I think that, uh, you know, if we come back to uh, 2018 and 2019, we have to recognize that at that time, uh, it has been uh, very difficult for our customers to, to really have an easy access to gallium generators. Uh, the, reason main for, the main reason for that was that, you know, we were uh, uh, to organize our production line. We were already uh, starting with, uh, with a new technology and uh, uh, we had really to make everybody working together in a very complex production, production line and production chain. Uh, so I think that it has impact, you know, the, the memories of all the end users, but of course now all of these belong to the past. And, and I think that we, we have proved in the last months that the, the robustness of, of our production and uh, capacity and production line is uh, as uh, dramatically improved. And in terms of lead time from orders to delivery, and even uh, in terms of services to replace, you know, our, potential uh, uh, faulty generators or, or incident that you may have at, at the end user place, it was really, really uh, uncomparable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, that's certainly our, our impression that, you know, across all of the different gallium generator manufacturers that there's been a significant increase in capacity, you know, lead times are down to a few weeks in, in terms of ordering generators. So, you know, plenty, plenty of generator availability as this, as this field grows. You know, I'd be interested, you know, Uno, from your perspective, you know, why is there, do you think, a misconception that, um, that Gallium 68 suppliers are not equipped to deliver in the, in the market need? Because, you know, clearly you're out selling cyclotron-based solutions. So to some extent, you're addressing that, that perception. What, what's, what's your angle on that? No, I think that that's a great point. I think a lot of people still may have a, this misconception that Gallium is a generator product. It's, it's obviously not correct, and it's been known to, to scientists for a long time that gallium can also be produced directly from the zinc reaction on a cyclotron. So I, I think I, I agree with Sean that we're, we're solving the problem here together, both from a generator side and from the cyclotron produced gallium. We started working a couple of years back, and, and obviously we're just ramping up right now. But I totally agree that from from this year, from 21 and onwards, I think we'll be able to meet the, the growing demand. And I think we'll talk more about it later in, in this discussion that the, the demand might be might be huge. And I've been around for so, such a long time that I also saw the rise of FTG. Of course, that took also a number of years to fix the problem. And eventually it was fixed, but uh, we, we have to be a little bit patient also with Gallium because we're, we're just, we're in the early days, but I think between generators and cyclotron, I think we have the problem under control. Mm -hmm. And I, they're very complementary technologies. Um, you know, clearly for high production volume environments, um, having the optionality of cyclotron produced gallium is very powerful, uh, but generators allow you to go the last mile. And I think, you know, the patient access um, is such a compelling part of, of gallium uh, availability for, for these new tracers. So. Um, I think it's great that we have, you know, two very complementary technologies that are are delivering on the potential. 
Um, so, you know, obviously the cyclotron based approaches are part of the way of uh, addressing the need, but I'd like, you know, Jean, I'd like to come back to, to your perspective in terms of delivering uh, or the demand for increased gallium, you know, how do you see the growth in larger output gallium generators? Do you think that's an important part of the industry's transition to commercial products in this space? Oh, certainly, Chris. I think that uh, all you know the the forecast that that uh, we can discuss or you can see uh, definitely show that that there will be a huge increase and a huge demand of, of gallium in, in the future. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, today uh, certainly the, the the first users of gallium generators they are certainly limited by the fact that the numbers of compound that can be leveled with gallium is rather reduced, and uh, and the indication is rather also uh, not you know at the scale that we expect. Uh, to have with, with a, a, a molecule like PSMA. And of course, as you mentioned earlier, we see a huge demand and a huge activity around new compounds to be, to be developed. And we, as, as gallium uh, producer, of course, we are in interface with uh, some of these uh, new and innovative companies uh, that are preparing for the future new compounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes, that makes sense. I, maybe switching back to the, the cyclotron you know, perspective, I know clearly with the cyclotron installation, you know, it's an interesting question to, to ask a GE guy, you know, because, you know, GE was always such a, you know, a solid F-18 focused uh, platform. Uh, but now, you know, you've got solid targetry and liquid targetry, but, you know, advanced targetry solutions for both uh, gallium and uh, zirconium and a whole bunch of other, a whole bunch of other interesting radio metals. Um, how do you, how do you feel the balance is going to play out in a production environment between gallium-based approaches and F-18-based uh, applications? Do you feel like there's a conflict or do you think there's a, a natural integration of the, the, the different isotopes in the production environment? A good, good aspect. I, of course, the, the answer lies in, in, for me, it lies in the half-life. So I, I think we still have a pretty good scenario with, with super long-lived like zirconium, which you can really produce at any time of the day, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Then you have the potential conflict between F-18, two hours, gallium 68, close to 70 minutes. I still think there is a pretty good match there. Obviously, the, the F-18 production is already happening very early in the day, if not in the, in the night. And I think that gallium is obviously the, the, the natural fit for the very early morning shift and for, for the midday shift. With a 68 minute half-life, of course, I think that there has to be room for multiple production really spread out over time. Today, we're seeing F-18 being super concentrated and it can be produced in, in even higher amounts, even though the, the gallium from a solid target is, is providing pretty substantial activity in, in three to four curie range of gallium chloride, which is obviously orders of magnitude higher than a generator. So it's about scale. But back to the original question, timing, I think, I think it's... It still matches well. Uh, potential conflict comes from, from more compounds beyond PSMA. When, when there is, there might be challenges down the road, but for PSMA, I think we're in good shape. You know, Serge, I'd love your viewpoint because I, I think the on-demand nature of gallium um, is something that, I mean, I've seen firsthand in your incredibly busy nuclear pharmacy. Um, you know, having the ability for the patient to come into, you know, into the imaging center, check in with reception, and then have someone dial down to nuclear pharmacy and have a dose made on demand. I mean, that's clearly an important part of your service. Yeah, absolutely. When the nuclear pharmacy is located within a hospital or in Europe, you may have in-house preparation pharmacies. Having a generator um, in a clinic with a very busy schedule is essential. Um, and it's not just because the clinic is interested in getting gallium doses on demand. It, it's more because the, the, the schedule of the gallium doses also affects all of the other tracer imaging doses, right? So, you know, there are multiple patients coming in, multiple cameras, and there's usually very little wiggle room with respect to when the patient gets injected to when the patient gets imaged. And you don't, if you don't have that flexibility, you're oftentimes you have to cancel several other scans in order to accommodate the scan of your choice. Now, having a gallium product and the ability to make it on site without the challenges of um, distribution makes it even more attractive. Um, and from the 
clinic ordering standpoint, from the clinician standpoint even, uh, clinicians uh, feel much more comfortable just giving a call to the nuclear pharmacy and literally having the dose in half an hour from giving us a call. So absolutely. Um, I think with respect to cyclotron produced uh, gallium, I think on solid targetry, yes, that will be, I would say, a complementary um, option for generators. Um, I think on the liquid target, it also has a place and maybe not as much in the US where uh, you know, many different uh, companies and pharmacies that have access to gallium. But if you look at developing countries, especially where the, the demand for the gallium tracers may not be as much initially, um, you know, having a liquid target on the machine that's producing FDC already is absolutely a good idea. So um, I, I welcome all of gallium suppliers and um, everyone who's able to provide it. And absolutely, gallium will always have a place in the clinic uh, just because of the flexibility and in some cases, the unavailability of other treatment options or diagnostic options. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that on-demand aspect. I mean, Delphine, I'd be interested in your, you, your viewpoint, assuming that you know, clinically, F18 and gallium PSMA are equal. I mean, let's just for argument's sake, take that viewpoint. Uh, obviously from a clinical workflow vantage point, having the ability to schedule your patients flexibly, I'd be interested in your thoughts on, on the scheduling flexibility elements that, uh, that come into play here. I've worked with a lot of F18 tracers. So this is my experience in terms of, you know, when you generate an F18 dose with, a, with specific radiopharmaceuticals, um, you can do that on a, on a somewhat demand basis as well, but when you start talking about larger markets and um, more the frequency of that, um, I could see that being challenging. Now, whether industry finds a way to solve that, and of course, you know, there's always innovation going on, but from a very sort of initial like perspective with comparing what it takes to fire up a cyclotron versus what it takes to elude a generator, it's obviously simpler to elude the generator. So from, from this expert opinion, we've heard, you know, that there's a lot of awareness about the balance of supply uh, in gallium between generators, cyclotrons. Um, and, you know, I think it's fair to say that, you know, the industry has matured a lot over the last couple of years to meet that demand for PSMA. Um, and so on the assumption that we have enough gallium available, however, which way it's obtained, um, I think the next key question is uh, the role of the distribution network and how it plays into that day-to-day -day delivery of doses. Uh, Dr. Chen, I think, you know, that's probably a nice segue to you to, you know, provide a little bit more of a physician perspective. You know, we, we've been talking about the supply chain and availability, and that clearly underpins clinical service. But I'd be really interested in your viewpoint on how did the, 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 the two different sort of distinct approaches play out, you know, irrespective of the, the, the distribution and the supply chain uh, aspects? So it can be, it depends on the situation, right? So um, with F18, you need to fire up a cyclotron and have an F18 supply and then um, be able to take that F18 to make the rated pharmaceutical. When you have add-on patients, certainly, if you have a generator in clinic and you can actually even, if you could even compound the dose, you know, and some, as some nuclear, as some hospitals have that nuclear pharmacy capability, if they can compound that on site, that clearly gives you an advantage in terms of being able to scan patients last minute. And especially for a place like us, um, where we get referrals from quite far away, you know, we're a major referral center for prostate cancer. Uh, we want to be able to accommodate those patients and minimize the challenges in scheduling for our patients who do come from far away. So, you know, being able to have that definitely serves the niche, especially for um, centers that have uh, that have large referral centers or that tend to get a lot of patients that are you know, last minute add-ons. Even if you don't have the nuclear pharmacy on site, having you know, a place like Cardinal who, you know, even they would then be able to, you know, depending on their logistics, it would be easier for them, I anticipate, to generate an on the spot dose uh, with a generator. Um, if they have those logistic processes in place, it would be easier to provide those um, add-on last minute doses. As we've heard from Dr. Chen, it's, it's really about uh, you know, the patient and, and getting an accurate diagnosis as early as possible. Um, but I'm interested to, to go back a little bit more to the machinations behind that availability. And I think you know, um, you know, I'm not aware of a nuclear pharmacy service uh, busier in, in the hospital environment than, than Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, so I'm interested now, you know, Serge, to get your viewpoint 
you know, to get down to the nitty gritty of making this happen in a hospital environment, in a nuclear medicine department, could you give us a little bit of a perspective on, um, on how you go about the process of fulfilling a, a dose of, of gallium PSMA? So the, the process is um, quite similar to all the other nuclear pharmacies where, you know, the, the kit, you could say, or the box that contains the reagents um, get shipped to us uh, periodically every few months or so. And then, like we mentioned before, we really do make it on demand. So uh, most of the time, uh, the, the patients are pre-scheduled um, and we have certain slots within the schedule. Um, and we know an hour before that we have to make uh, the, uh, the drug. And I really want to point out the fact and sort of the advantage of having the kitted approach. Now, this was alluded to a little bit before um, in this meeting and we, we speak F18 versus Gallium, but I think another sort of very critical um, consideration to make is having a kit versus um, a centrally produced or cyclotron produced product. And the reason is, um, it's just for the pharmacist, it's much more simple uh, to rely on a kitted uh, process. The, 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 the efforts, uh, the staffing, the regulatory requirements, the ease, uh, the analytical methods that I need to be uh, performed for batch release, uh, they're much less demanding than for essentially produced products. So essentially the, the efficiency of the operations and the recovery for those of us, for those centers that actually have to keep themselves uh, financially alive uh, increases with implementing gallium kitted products production because you're investing less and you're getting more out of the product. And you're saying it's generally a more cost-effective approach. It's a much more cost-effective approach than running a cyclotron facility. Um, and even with the cost of the generators, if the demand from the clinic is enough, um, oftentimes if it exceeds the demand for one generator, you buy another generator and you could have my word on it. If you have sufficient demand, it's, a, it's an efficient operation. Um, but going back to the actual practical aspects of production, again, the requirements are usually the uh, the generator is uh, enclosed in a shielded ISO 5 or a septic area. And really the process for most kitted products is uh, you uh, take the, the vial, which has usually the precursor material, um, you add the buffer to it, and then you just load the generator, um, gallium uh, from the generator into the vial. In some cases, you have to heat it in a heating block, similar like you do for technetium compounds. And basically, usually in about 10 minutes, you have your final drug product, where if you were to do a cyclotron production, of course, that process would take a lot longer. So it's very simple. The, the, the burden of fully characterizing the, the product is really on the kitted supplier. So as a pharmacist, you really just have to make sure that the, the radionuclide has incorporated. And that testing is usually done using the same equipment uh, that is done on technetium kitted products. So in in terms of rolling out or having the ability to produce it um, at an academic institution or a nuclear radio pharmacy, it, it just becomes a lot more attractive. It sounds like a very streamlined process. I mean, you know, the actual preparation of the doses is, is a few minutes and then you've got QC and so forth. What in the process of preparing the gallium PSMA dose, what do you, where do you feel there are opportunities to improve the workflow? Is it, is it, an, is it by having larger generators where you can do um, you know, more ad hoc elution, or where where are the where are the practice bottlenecks from a hospital nuclear pharmacy perspective? Well, you know, when you say having a larger generator, that's a very interesting question because uh, the demand for a larger generator with, in an academic setting where you don't have to distribute, you usually just send the doses to the nuclear medicine department. Um, it really depends on the clinical schedule, and I just want to again reiterate it that a lot of the processes and the the drawbacks and the advantages of having a gallium kit, they ultimately stem from the clinic where you have the, the clinical imaging schedule, you have multiple teams of different nurses, technologists, uh, clinicians, medical oncologists, nuclear medicine physicians that have to sort of come together and tell you what, what you want. So um, for some of the uh, kitted products like gallium dorate, for example, you know, because the demand uh, or the number of doses is not that much, uh, we are able to uh, sort of accommodate as needed uh, using either a single generator or sometimes it's just by two generators. Uh, for a product like PSMA, after it gets approval, of course, 
of course, the, the, the demand from the clinic will go up and having the ability to prepare multiple doses from a single production uh, with a delivery time of 90 seconds to the nuclear medicine, uh, of course, then the demand for the high activity generator becomes much, much more relevant, you could say. So, so yeah, absolutely. I look forward to higher generators and possibly even making, you know, four curies of gallium as the last production of the day on an academic institution cyclotron and having that ability to actually make multiple kits similar to commercial nuclear radio pharmacies. So I think ultimately to answer the question uh, depends on the degree of demand from the clinic. You know, I have one last question for you, sir. Your, your team's an extremely experienced team. You routinely build uh, your own cold kits for different solutions. I'm, I'm wondering for, from a leading academic center perspective, what's the advantage in practical terms for you in terms of, you know, taking an off-the-shelf commercially available product versus, uh, you know, cooking your own? So again, the, the, the ease of use, um, and in particular with uh, age bad CC, um, you know, PSMA 11 kit, um, it really is the, the robustness and the ease of use. So uh, this is by far the, the, the simplest kit to use. Um, if you literally just take the peptide vial, the buffer, and then add the, uh, the, the gallium to it and the kit, you know, the drug product is ready. If and when we develop our own kits, um, usually it's up to us to actually validate the, the process of preparation of the kit. We have to do various experiments. We have to uh, check on certain things to make sure that we could reproducibly make the same kit. Moreover, when we produce for the clinic, um, you know, the degree uh, or the extent of analytical methods that are needed to be performed in order to allow uh, patient injection um, is much more uh, elaborate. It's much more extensive. When you're getting a ready-to-use cold kit, um, really, like I mentioned before, the only analysis that I needed is really just to test the incorporation uh, of the radionuclides. Uh, there is the visual inspection and a pH check. So really, that's all that's needed. So from the, um, the efficiency standpoint, the ease of use standpoint, um, it doesn't get any uh, better than this. Yeah, I mean, look, I think it, you know, our perception is that there's, um, you know, that, that at least in the U.S. market where PSMA is going to be a very large volume, very, um, you know, commercially directed, uh, you know, activity in the nuclear pharmacy, that uh, working with a synthesizer based approach um, is just going to be a lot of time and complexity lost where you really can't, whether it's a commercial nuclear pharmacy or, an academic nuclear pharmacy, an in-hospital nuclear pharmacy, you just don't have that time, uh, you know, to, to do a production and frankly, to lose, lose patient doses. Uh, I mean, and that's going to be the net result, right? For your given level of activity that you're going to be able to elute big generator, small generator. Uh, if you have to do a synthesizer based production to make a gallium based product, you're ultimately going to, going to reduce the number of doses you can make in a day. Absolutely. Dr. Chen, uh, since you have the clinician perspective, uh, you know, what is going to be the ultimate uh, impact of PSMA uh, approvals this year? I mean, we're expecting to see at least two solutions approved in the market this year. Um, how do you see that impacting patient care? And, and where is the predominance of that impact? Is it in, in the early disease setting or is it in, in, in post uh, in, in biochemical reoccurrence? Perhaps you can give us some perspectives there. Yeah, that's a really good question too. I mean, because the obvious, uh, the obvious application is for lutetium and other, you know, radiopharmaceutical based PSMA therapies. I think that uh, there is still a lot of work that to be done, and it's an open field in terms of understanding how the PSMA PET information can be used and incorporated in the clinical, both the clinical diagnostic and treatment algorithm. You know, we focus very much on the diagnostic sensitivity of it because that's where it has really shown. You know, it's really um, added a lot of value to our conventional imaging techniques for um, characterizing the full extent of disease. But one of the advantages of PET radiopharmaceuticals in general is that it gives you some specific phenotypic information about the cancer. And so I think that open questions about what does this tell us about cancer biology? How are we altering that cancer biology with treatment? especially as we get into di um, you know, targeted therapies, immunotherapies, um, you know, uh, just 
all the different ways that we are finding to target these cancer cells, they are likely going to have different effects on the um, availability of the PSMA ligand and whether we can bind it and its expression. And so I think that um, a lot of that experience is um, to be developed actually, as soon as we have access to this, you know, wider access, um, we will be able to study that more effectively. Um, especially in, a, in the context of multi-center trials, you know, with ongoing uh, different therapies that are being tested and with the PSMA PET imaging incorporated into those clinical trials, I think we will learn more about um, can we, you know, can we extract more phenotyping information that complements MR and CT or even FDG PET in certain, um, you know, clinical scenarios or other traces that are being developed. There's a lot of opportunity there. And I think a lot of unknowns because we don't have a lot of data, um, you know, and we won't have that until we have wider access to the, to the imaging technology. Serge, you're up next. You know, what does an approved PSMA product uh, mean in, in practical terms? I mean, Memorial has been doing PSMA scans for a long time. Um, you know, does this, does this mean anything to the way that you offer clinical service? Uh, what it means is, is that the service will become um, even more efficient um, and, you know, the support that we will get from using uh, kits for gallium imaging will allow us to focus more um, on the other uh, development work that we do. So in other words, um, the clinical use or the clinical tracers or the standard of care tracers that we normally use and produce, um, sort of the recovery from those projects usually goes to the development of new agents. But for us, it's critical that we have as many, that we produce as many commercially um, available agents as we can. So I think, you know, we all should acknowledge um, the, the fundamental role that UCLA and UCSF have played in driving the awareness and adoption of this important technology. But we certainly share uh, the viewpoint that this is about getting a last mile service to men everywhere not just men living in, in the big cities, but also, you know, in more, uh, you know, in smaller towns and in rural settings. And I think that's really where the nuclear pharmacy environment comes into its own. So I think we can all feel good about the fact that in New York, where, where surges, we're going to have large patient volumes that will require, um, you know, a certain sort of operating model. And then, you know, there's a whole continuum of supply, um, you know, as a function of, of different population environments, and we're going to be able to cover them all. Uno G has has been a consistent innovator uh, in this space and clearly has a, a you know a formidable track record uh, in the cyclotron solutions and, and radiochemistry solutions. You know, I also note I'm personally excited about the potential of looking at PSMA in the PET MRI space as well. I think MRI and PET provide a complementary viewpoint of uh, of the disease, and it would be interesting to know from your perspective. Where, where is PSMA? Where is PSMA going from a technology development perspective, and what impact does it have on on the GE perspective? It has really a huge impact. I, as some of you already touched that, bring it up, Chris. PetMR, PetMR is probably the ultimate diagnostic tool. However, of course, there are some drawbacks in time and, and so forth. But the results coming out from the, some of the PetMR studies in in Europe and elsewhere around PSMA are just amazing. So I think, I mean, we have a, such a great future together here and we're building it as we speak here. We're building scale, good discussions. Um, and I think we, we might even be underestimating the needs here. And this is why we are so excited to build the scale here, the scale of finance to, to take the cost down, complexity, and to be able to provide, especially to the big markets. That, I think that goes for some of the institutions as well, MSK and, and uh, MD Anderson and other prominent institutions. They may have 30 to 40 patients in a day if they wanted to, because the, the approval is for, for, the, for the metastatic discovery of the, of the cancer. So I think we're, we have a challenge. I, I think we, we are, we're on it. And it's about not only the, the cyclotron produced gallium, it's about the scanning, it's about to have the, the fastest scanner with the, with the best software to, to process everything. And, and it would be great to hear Dr. Chan's point of view there, because that might also be a limiting factor. Yeah. So I think that the availability of the most advanced scanner technology that gives you the crispest, sharpest images with the most accurate quantity of data is a constant ongoing 
I would say, challenge for the field in general. Um, every institution wants to have the best scanner or technology available, but there's a life to all of those scanners. And at some point it's going to become outdated while other centers get the newer scanners and then they have the most advanced scanner technology. So I think that is a challenge that it, it you know, it's a great, uh, it's a great, um, it's a great question to bring up in this context because you know when you're handling an isotope like gallium 68 you want to optimize those reconstructions to get the best possible images to get the best possible diagnostic quality i think it's certainly it's going to drive the demand for new scanner installations uh it's going to drive the demand for uh you know for performance in those installations you know because it's partially about image quality but it's also about throughput as well uh so we're, we're going to see a throughput demand uh for sure and I think, you know, we, you know, as we discussed already, you know, institutions like UCLA and UCSF have, have really led, you know, been at the vanguard of the clinical applications. We should always remember that PS, whenever a urologist discovers a target, it always has a P for prostate out the front. But this is actually an interesting target and in a lot of different clinical indications. And so I think we can expect to see the academics to find a lot of new and exciting ways to use this technology. So even if the the clinical scope today is mostly focused on prostate cancer. There's, there's plenty of other opportunities out there as well. John, uh, you know, clearly Irie uh, is one of the leading suppliers of, of generators, a key partner for Cardinal Health. Uh, I imagine that a very su substantial proportion of the patient doses made uh, in the United States uh, over the next uh, 12 months are gonna, are gonna come from, uh, from Irie uh, generators. How are, you, how are you gearing up for this moment? I think there are three things that are very important. It's really, uh, the first thing is, is quality. Uh, and we are really committed to uh, uh, improve and, and increase uh, the output of, of, of generator that we can, we can produce. We are ready for that. Uh, the second point is uh, that uh, uh, in terms of quality, we, we, I heard of, of course, you know, with much interest, the, uh, the, uh, the high capacity generator that we are working upon it will bring uh, certainly huge uh, uh, flexibility and, and, and uh, uh, offer much more capacity for, for the numbers of procedures that we expect uh, to see increased in, in, in your premises. Uh, but this being said, the second point is, of course, you know, the, the quality, because uh, as, as uh, you know, even if we compare sometimes our generator to a, to a technician generator, the big difference is that usually you keep them in your, in your lab you know, for eight to 12 months potentially up to the end of the shelf life. And, and it, that means that we have to be sure that during this time, when you use this product, you can rely upon them, you know, from uh, uh, the, the early time in the morning when you make your first solution until the last time of the day. And, uh, and the, the last point may be the, the, the service that is important because we understand that the, the demand, the medical demand is extremely high and, and we need to be sure that in case of any problem, we as, as a, a generator manufacturer were able to respond to, to our end users and, and, and to a supplier like, like Cardinal Health because we, we definitely don't want to miss the opportunity of development. Well, I think that's a, gr that's a, great, uh, that's a great point. That, that whole quality in the supply chain is really important. And I think it's, it's what's exciting, exciting to me about the journey that we've been on together the last couple of years uh, is that you know you're developing products which are designed to meet the dynamic environment of the nuclear pharmacy? Uh, we started this discussion with questions about how the supply and demand of gallium will be met once uh, new tracers like PSMA are available, and what the impact will be on healthcare providers and patients. From our terrific panel, I think we can come to sort of three general, more technology-led conclusions. Uh, you know, one is is that. Cyclotron and uh, solid target, um, liquid target, gallium generators will come together and provide a continuum of solutions that will meet on the demand. Uh, and, you know, there are clear, uh, even from this conversation, there's clear evidence that important partnerships are being forged in the industry to prepare for this. Uh, clearly that the patient will really benefit from the flexibility of dose preparation. And this is a real advantage of the gallium based approach. And that, you know, ultimately the, the actors, whether it's at the, you know, supply end or the technology end like, uh, like Irie or, or Telix, um, that, you know, the goal is to build that very efficient workflow that ultimately gives that flexibility to the, to the physician and, and to the patient. Dr. Chen, 
you know, you should have the final say since ultimately we do all of this for the benefit of the patient. Is there anything else that, you know, you'd like to add to the, uh, you know, to the final comments? Sure. So first of all, for patients, um, it's a huge boon for patients. You know, all of every patient with cancer wants to know where their cancer is, how much is there, and what are we going to do about it? How are we going to get rid of it? And with prostate cancer specifically, um, as I mentioned earlier, we just have had not, our tools have not been great for detecting where that prostate cancer is. The PSA blood test is very sensitive, so we know that there prostate cancer somewhere. But when we have challenges in finding it, then it makes it challenging to make a recommendation to the patient in terms of what the best treatment options are. Obviously, we do our best and we have a lot of history and literature and um, experience doing that. But can we tailor that treatment to minimize the morbidities, to minimize the impact on their quality of life and improve the efficacy of their treatment? So for patients, it's going to be a boon. And I think that um, a lot of patients, you know, they've, they've stayed in touch with the literature and are aware of it and are asking for it. And I think rightfully so, you know, they want to know what's going on with their cancer. For providers, um, both for on the imaging side and for um, oncologists and um, other uh, physicians taking care of these patients, I think it's only going to expand our ability to understand these, uh, what these cancers are doing and how to best treat our patients. It's going to help us uh, better figure out when, when we should go to surgery, when should we go to radiation therapy, when should we choose these different systemic therapies, and then when we look at those targeted therapies, are we expressing the antigen that we need to express for that therapy to be effective? So it definitely improves our ability to select patients and our ability to hopefully monitor response. So I think that's another open area that we're all looking for, you know, is CT enough? Like if, they, if the tumor shrinks, maybe we don't need any more than that. We just want the tumor to be gone and it doesn't matter how it's gone as long as it disappears. But if it doesn't disappear, that's where this imaging could really help us understand why it isn't it. And is it because it lost antigen expression or is, does it have persistent antigen expression and there's some other piece that, that's, not, that, that's not connecting with the treatment? Um, I think that those are all potential areas where this will be a, a really big growth area for us in terms of how we use it and how it improves our ability to help patients. And then finally, as you mentioned, on the research side, I think those possibilities are just endless. The field is wide open in terms of identifying new territory for how to, how to leverage these new technologies. So it should be clear from this panel discussion today, which has been really excellent, by the way, that there is a significant demand for gallium uh, 68 and uh, a number of uh, really exciting solutions to meet that demand, both in terms of the fundamental technologies for producing gallium, as well as the supply chain and, and production approaches that are used. Uh, Telix has been very active in supporting the development of the space uh, through the various partnerships with, with IRE, Cardinal Health, uh, GE Healthcare, and others. And you know, we believe that there's a clear strategy for meeting the demand uh, for gallium PSMA. And, and that demand is really gonna be reflective of the flexibility that this approach offers uh, in routine clinical practice. So I'd like to uh, summarize and conclude by thanking the panel members uh, for their contribution today, uh, and also to uh, acknowledge the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging for their support of this program. This concludes our symposium event. Thank you very much. <laughs>